wasn't just one day in May at Wembley, it was four consecutive playoffs. It was a long, long journey. And so we're in the final. We're in the final. <laughs> it was like the 46 games came down in the afternoon. Everyone, apart from that football club, the fans gave everything. And it was just magical. I get asked this question a lot. Was I jealous that I wasn't actually playing in the game that day? You're damn right I was jealous. This could finish it! And he has! We were like a bottle of champagne ready to be opened to go boom into the Premier League. So it's soaring to the Premiership. George Burley now. For me, Ipswich has always been a family club. Young players coming through and, and bringing other players into the fold, which is so important. For a club like Ipswich, we need to do that. The club is still the heart of the community and the heart of the town. That is what Ipswich is famous for when you speak to people. As soon as you mention Ipswich, people will tell you about the football team. I can remember, if you weren't an Ipswich Town fan, what were you? What was the point? Why, why did you support somebody else? When I think of Ipswich in the late 90s, I think of youth mixed with experience, exciting attacking football, a lot of academy players, fantastic manager, a real family club. They didn't demand us to win, they, they were with us all the way, it was them and us going together to try and get to the Premier League. I was a young 15 year old when I came to the club and made my debut. I told Trevor when I was 17, under Bobby Robson. He always gave young players the opportunity and the encouragement to improve and get into the first team. From 73 to 82 in Europe every year, and when you tell people that had there been a Champions League, we'd have been in it six years running, uh, people say, what? <laughs> you know, they can't believe that, really. It was a brilliant club to play for. From Suffolk, I came through the ranks. As a young player, I couldn't have wished for it to be at a better club. The summer of 99, I think we were hopeful this might be our year. We'd been knocking on the door a number of times. We'd been in the playoffs a number of times and it hadn't quite got over the line. And I think going into that season, we were hopeful that actually this was going to be the season that we potentially could get into the Premier League. I had to sell a player every now and again, but it was always reinvested in, you know, some players. You know, Matt Holland from Bournemouth, Jim Magilton from Sheffield Wednesday Reserves, Mark Venus from, a, from Wolves. George Burley had a very good eye for players. And whilst we did lose some important players, he also brought in players that he felt would fit into the style of football, fit in with the dressing room as well, good characters. I think that was important. As we'd seen in previous seasons, we did sell to Rico and we did sell players and we still could never get over the, the hump. So me going and obviously the club investing the money back into the team, it still wasn't a given that we're gonna get promoted. You may lose a player, but you're still trying to build something. You don't want to destroy it completely. Every season, when you look at the budget, we had just maybe bring in a million pounds to balance the books. Sometimes we'd sell somebody like Kieran for six, seven million pounds, but bring in somebody like Marcus Stewart for less money, but can help you get promoted just as well as what Kieran would have happened. And bringing John McGrail in gave us that stability and quality at the back. Jermaine Wright was a midfield player that could play anywhere along the middle four. You've got to tweak it slightly, and sometimes you've got to tweak the system or you've got to play in a different manner to get the best out of your squad. What happened that season, which didn't happen, is that we started the season really well. I think we won the first six out of six. And by the previous season, it was our form after Christmas that got us in the playoffs. This was different this season, and I think we thought all of a sudden we've, we've got a team here that's, that's good enough to go up. The one thing that sticks out in my mind is the amount of times that we came back in games. You know, I think we went behind 
numerous times, but we, there was so much character, so much quality in the team as well, that we always felt we could come back. Ferguson has made his way forward inside that Ipswich six-yard area. And Bolton Wanderers have taken the lead. One almost comical day against Norwich. We played a three, so they started with a three, so we changed to a four, and they changed to a four, and then we went back to a three, and then they went back to a three. They were trying to stop us. I think we were a, a good football inside at the time, but if you look back, we're quite direct with the goals. Picking a pass, you had the lunatic that was Magilton in front of them, getting the ball, demanding the ball, an amazing footballer. Jermaine could pass it really crisply and clinically, but would work really hard and put himself about. You had Matty Holland who covered every blade of grass every game. Naylor with a knockdown, and Holland is onto it! <laughs> Great chance. I remember going to watch Matt Holland when he played for Bournemouth, and he was captain. I think he was only about 21 and 22. And I think I went with Charlie Woods, and I sat there to Charlie, I said, you'll do me, Charlie. You know, it's one of these where you say, yeah, his attitude and commitment was second to none. I remember the last game of the season, and, and it was uh, home to Walsall. And forget what might happen to Manchester City at Blackburn. For Ipswich, only a win will do here. When I scored, it was the roar from the crowd that we knew then we'd jump from third into second. Here's Mowbray. And this time he's got it! It's David Johnson! He sort of came flying over, and it seemed like the, the whole ground knew that we were potentially going up. What a celebration and what a moment for David Johnson. But then it all went it all went wrong. Another emotional roller coaster ride. Ipswich Town have achieved the win they wanted. But it's Manchester City who enjoy the promotion party after avoiding defeat at Blackburn. And it's going to be playoffs. We could see that we weren't going to get second place. And uh, guess what, we've got to go to Bolton. <laughs> yeah, look, we have to put it into context. Bolton were a, were, a, were a decent football team with some good players. 2-0 down, and you're thinking, here we go again. Up stepped Marcus Stewart, and he was absolutely exceptional for us from the minute he arrived at the club to the minute he left. And that particular game, he was outstanding. Stewart! Oh, magnificent strike! What a fantastic goal from Marcus Stewart! Suddenly, suddenly they've got some hope. The ball came to Matty Holland. Matty then just taps it through. The weight of pass was absolutely perfect. Top pass, Matty, by the way. And I just let it run across my body, a little no-touch turn, and it sat up so nice for me to hit it first time. One of my favourite things is Yaskalan and sprawling against that post. We later learned that Marcus Stewart was an absolute goal machine. His quality and his composure in front of goal stands out. You know, people talk about Marcus Stewart and, and maybe a lack of pace. I tell you what, he had the first five yards in his head. His movement for defenders was a nightmare. He had that ability to see the back of his defender's shirt. They didn't know where he was. Clashed with the goalkeeper, hurt my shoulder, and I went to hospital and they didn't think I'd play in the next game. But I was watching the second half to get the second, you know, I was screaming in a Bolton hospital and it's with these old people next to me and they wondered what I was doing. I was still in my Ipswich kit, so it was even better. Now Rusak, clap him again. I remember Jessica Linen coming out of his goal. I had an opportunity, do I take it early and chip it over him or do I take it around him? So I went around him and there was a tight space. Far corner, I think, just curl it in that corner. Fantastic finish! His two goals in that game were so important, as had been some of the ones leading up to the playoffs anyway, but he was an outstanding acquisition in the January from George Burley. George Burley not prone to showing much emotion when he's on the bench. Getting that equaliser certainly put us in um, good stead for the return leg. The second leg at home is still the best game of football that I think I have ever seen or will ever see. 
people tell me that uh, that night was the most nervous and uh, most entertaining as an Ipswich fan that I'd ever seen. So when I got into the ground, we were already 1 0 down, and that was the start of the roller coaster. Jim Magilton was a man possessed that night. Magilton again. Penalty. He's going to end up with it to score a penalty, but then go looking for the person that committed the foul. And Jim's right up there with the very best in terms of his ability, his desire, his quality. Johnson just trying to get Magilton away. Magilton, terrific man. Fantastic goal by Jim Magilton. I mean, it was a Jim Magilton show. He was incredible that day. Just the left of Twitch Town wanted at the start of the second half. His sheer force of personality that Jim imposed on that game. Back in the game by Venus. Mowbray with a header on. Magilton! Like of all the games I could miss at Ipswich, I missed that game and it still bugs me to this day. It's a hat -trick for Jim Magilton. That still pains me today that I missed the great Jim Magilton, probably at the peak of his powers. Then went on into extra time and sending offs happened and Clapham then scored and Rusa going through on goal. He is still my favourite Ipswich Town player ever and partly because of that goal and his Wembley goal is just, he gets on the ball, he's running through, you know he's going to score, you know he's going to look good. I was 11 years old at the time and I think it's the first time that I ever left a match having completely lost my voice, I, I had nothing left. For Ipswich Town, which will take them to Wembley. At the final whistle, obviously loads of people flooded onto the pitch. Ad being the cautious and quiet person that he was, he tried to stop us from doing it and said that we weren't doing it and then eventually we managed to convince him that we were and ran onto that pitch. In the lead until 50 seconds from the end of normal time. Singing K Sera Sera. Ipswich in front for the first time in extra time. I just remember coming out of the ground into the into the town and sort of it was an atmosphere almost like when you're in a foreign country after a game, there's people going around tooting their horns and the whole town was on a high. And I remember listening to it on Radio Suffolk, reliving it in the front room, jumping around the front room, going mad, knowing that we were we were then going to Wembley. One more game and one more win, and Ipswich will be back in the Premiership. Final whistle. That was the worst moment, and that possibly was one of the lowest points of my career. I just went up for a header. As I went up, I felt this, something I've never felt before. It's like a pop. I knew I wasn't going to play in the final. I knew from that, that day that 10 days later, what I'd just done was, was a serious injury, and I just buried my head for an hour. That's when you're then planning, you know, what, what shirt to wear. This is the makeshift bedsheet banner that I made on the kitchen table a couple of days after the Bolton playoff semi-final win. Uh, something that I took to Wembley and uh, walked down Wembley Way with it. Just about keeping one piece and uh, stand the test of time. I remember joining the queue and we were probably just about where we are now on the away supporters ticket office there. Queuing all the way around the ground, into the gym, up the stairs. My parents bought me a McDonald's over as we were halfway through the queue and I had a cheque from my dad, a blank cheque, which I was to buy the tickets with. You feel the excitement, you feel that the media are more involved, they're starting to turn up at the training ground, they're starting to ask for interviews. It was obviously a different experience, it wasn't like any other game, but in terms of the training and what we did, we tried to keep it as calm as possible. We were trying very hard to do it right. And George had a very good idea, as did the coaching staff and all of them, and they wanted to go away two or three days before the game, get into the, you know, into the zone. I mean, football is a game of habits, you know, and it always has been, and it's that continual improvement which we learned under Sir Bobby. So there was no change. 
to have three playoff losses and to never even make it to Wembley and now I'm seeing the team that I love with all my friends uh, getting the chance to play in at Wembley probably in front of 40 odd thousand Ipswich fans I, of course I was jealous. I used to go to a hairdresser Franco's and he says oh let me do your hair blue I'm like an idiot yeah yeah no problem if we lost, I'd look an idiot, and if we won, I'd look an even bigger idiot. 20 years on, looking at the same pictures. As soon as you get close to Wembley and you see the crowds, then your heart starts to go a little bit faster and you, you're starting to realise what the day, what the moment, what might happen. Look down Wembley Way and it was just literally half blue, half red. It really felt like, you know, everyone from Ipswich was there. Wembley always held a special place, really, in, in, your, in your mind. And then when you're driving up to Wembley and you, and you see the Twin Towers, it's like, well, actually, this, this is real now. This is, I'm, I'm actually going to do it. I'm actually going to play at Wembley. Not many people in their careers get to play at Wembley Stadium. You can have an 18-year football career and never touch that turf, and you have to enjoy it when you're there. Wembley for me was fantastic, winning it in 78 in the cup final, but to actually take your team there, the, the club you've been with you know, virtually all your life, and thinking if we can win this game we're going to be back in the Premiership. It was really tough for James Scowcroft not to be involved. Uh, he'd been such a big part of the season, such a key player for us, and for him to miss out on a day like that was, was really tough. I sat on a bench and George just said, oh, just walk out the team. I was never one to really do that. And then I come up and so I remember walking out Wembley and, you know, it's fantastic. I think if you ask most of the players on that day, they would just like to have turned up 10 minutes before kickoff and kicked off because dealing with emotions and the team talks and stuff like that an hour before is quite a tough thing to do, I think. So I think it would have been nice to just start the game. But when the game starts, you're ready for it. when the game starts, we end to end. And then all of a sudden, Hignett finds a little bit of space, unleashes this shot for, I think, 25 yards. Fantastic shot. We've gone behind so often in previous games, we've come back, and I don't think there was any sense of panic because it happened so early in the game. I remember turning to my uncle and saying, I don't think we're going to do it now sort of reassured me, you know, plenty of time, it was only five minutes in. And then David Johnson went off injured as well, very early in the game. Ball came across, I couldn't reach it. I just had to come off because I was letting my team down. But what a chance for Richard Neal, he's a neighbour of mine. Yeah, you're buzzing, you're desperate to get on and contribute and just get on and make an impact. Me and Stewie, I think, had a really good understanding and he was an intelligent player and I enjoyed playing with him, working with him, working off him. So I was looking forward to just getting on and, you know, working with him and, and hoping to create some chances. If Scoey was probably fit that day, then Richard Naylor probably doesn't have the impact he, he did. So, yeah, it was a good thing that Jono got injured and Scoey was injured. And then you're thinking, crikey, it's not sure they're going to be one of those where they've gone behind the game, lost one of our key players, our top scorer that season. You start thinking, oh, surely not. Penis. Stewart wouldn't call for him. Does for Clapham. We obviously got back into the game, and it, and it came through a figure who I have got the utmost respect for in Tony Mowbray. Oh, it's in! And it's Tony Mowbray! Tony was one of the best headers of the ball I've ever worked with. Climbed above the Barnsley defence and knotted it straight into the roof of the net. At the time, thinking he's 35, 36, and that was really old, and I'm now approaching that age, and I realise it's, it's actually not that old, but to jump that high and to be that strong against so many other players was fantastic. He was infectious, you know, he was a, a very, very good footballer. He's just told us that he wanted to head the ball a bit more, but he kept nicking it. He always headed the ball, I didn't want to head it anymore. <laughs> 
I was in Glasgow and George was phoning me. I'd just lost my wife to breast cancer and um, I was going through a difficult spell really, trying to resurrect my football career. It'd been, you know, I don't know, six months since my wife had passed away and uh, I was trying to get back on the grass and play for Celtic and, um, and try and make an impact. There was times where I, I just wouldn't take his call because I would see it was Josh Burley again from if just God. I wasn't ready to move away. I was visiting a grave every day for six months of my life, every day taking flowers. It was such a, a difficult decision for me to go, right, I need to move on with my life. But when I'd made that decision, it, it wasn't because it was George or it was Ipswich, it was, it was a place a long, long way away. And I thought that was the best thing to make a clean cut. As my kids get older, I repetitively show them that goal because it probably epitomises what I was about, really aggressive, attacking the ball, heading it, that contact, that jump, that leap. When I go to my mother's in Red Car in Teesside now, you know, all these years later, there's still a scaffolding tube bent on the, on the washing line with a ball hanging from it. That's how I learned to head the ball, really. My dad was a scaffolder and he had a bent scaffolding tube off the washing line with a ball in a bag hanging. In his last game, was able to do that on that stage. The delivery was great from Jim, but Mogger's header, wow, at the far post. Then, of course, we give a penalty away. Pick that is always getting for me. So this is what I love about this penalty. I used to take penalties against Richard Wright. Say I took 30 pennies, 20 were for me. But every time you say, Marcus, I want you to take 10 for me now. I said, what do you mean for me? He say, I want you to tell me which way you're going to go. And he would save probably between seven and nine of my penalties each time. Well, the high pressure situation is on Darren. Bond. Stood on a halfway line. And I'm thinking, Richard, just go the right way. Because I know if you go the right way, you've got every chance of saving it. Right stands tall and saves it! The man who gave the penalty away! For him to make that save, I think, was at such a crucial time as well. I think that was important. You get asked the question often, who's the best manager that you work with? George is, for me, right up there. I would say made me a much better player. He gave you for chance. He gave all these players that have gone on to bigger and better things in the era I played for, he was the one who actually gave us a chance. And we'll always be thankful, we'll always be grateful because, especially in today's football, kids don't really get a chance because managers want to go with experience because their job's on the line, but George lived and died by youth. George pretty much wasn't a particularly strong orator. I don't think that was one of his big strengths, you know, Churchillian speeches. But it wasn't needed. When you've got a dressing room like what we had with experience and, and good players and good characters, you don't need that them sort of speeches. I think George was amazing. He was driven. He knew how he wanted us to play. You know, he wanted us to play the Ipswich way. I couldn't say that George was a great coach. We had five training sessions and they were the same training sessions, Monday, Tuesday, off Wednesday trained Thursday, Friday, and we did the same things in those days. I look back now and think, so George was cleverer than I thought. It's about routine. Keep working on the basics, keep doing the basics better. 20 years on, I'm thinking, he might have been ahead of his time. It's easy just to go and sign somebody and not really know enough about them, but the selection bit, we really got right then. And, and so bringing Marcus Stewart in, to then have David Johnson, you know, Jamie Scowcroft, Richard Naylor, and Marcus Stewart, uh, and then at the very end, bring in Martin Rooser as well. <laughs> this was really, really great management, I think. When you've got a good manager like George, you need a team around him. Dale was, was so important to George um, and, and so important to the dressing room as well because he, he was such a good, fun character as well. You know, In times when there was pressure on the team and things weren't going particularly well, you needed it lighting up at times and Dale had that ability to lighten the dressing room and you know sadly no longer with us um, behind the scenes and always had a good quip I remember we used to get weighed every Friday and, and Jim Majilton would go onto the scales and, and Dale's famous line was always one at a time when Jim got on the scales which was brilliant the lads loved it Stewart. Oh, and Naylor could be through here. And Naylor has scored! 
Maybe Richard wasn't renowned for his deft touches, but this was a fantastic touch. Just lift it over the top of the keeper. Ipswich are knocking on the door of the Premiership. If Marcus got off the air and get the timing right and flicked it on, and I think the defender overcooked it a little bit, which allowed me to get in behind him. The keeper came out and that was deceptively quick in them days, so I managed to get there first and just lifted it over him. He wasn't the first name on the team sheet, but he was a massive part of the squad. But you need people who will step up when needed, and Bam Bam in that final was absolutely outstanding. You know, what an ox of a man, well, you know, he had muscles on his muscles, Richard. He took the shirt off in the celebration, he wouldn't have got any stick for it because he was bigger, stronger, and, and would have beaten us all up, I think. What about Neil, what an impact he's made. Johnson going off, fabulous. Felt we were a team that could soak pressure up. We knew how to defend in numbers and fill spaces and, and when we got it, we knew where to pass it and how to break away or whether to keep it and stretch the pitch out. So getting in front was a period where I, I felt, yeah, we can hang on to this. Wright is moving to get into the area, Croft attempting to join him. Jermaine Wright! Dale saying to me a couple of weeks before the final about, when she made one run, just don't worry if you don't get it, just make another run. And I think that was about my second or third run before Vino actually played the ball. Taylor's away again here now, and he's got him behind Morgan. Good initial touch and support coming now in the form of Clapham. Stewart! 3-1! When it comes to celebrating the game, I'm a bit lost because I've just scored at Wembley. Just put our team 3-1 up. That really was the oh my god moment with we're, we're really going to do this. Seemingly now on an unstoppable surge. The signing Marcus Stewart was an extraordinary deal. I was a bit surprised because I didn't see it coming. Within two hours, I'm expected to be training. I was on the motorway to Itches. Uh, what I do know is that Huddersfield was sick as parrots. I mean, they really were. But there we go. They sold. We bought. <laughs> That's a great work again, Benilla. And really, what a game! This and I managed to get on the end of it and bring it down. Just lays it back. Jamie's, you know, is one of the fittest lads I've played with, got past me to, to put the ball in the, the, into the box. And Marcus, again, just timing on his, his movement. And, you know, he's very good in the air for a small player and, and put it away. So I think my contribution was, was small in that, to be honest, compared to, you know, Stewie, Vino, Jamie, everyone. Yet again, that could be the one he thinks. The perfect cross, the perfect run, and the perfect header. And those sort of things don't happen very often. It just seemed like this is our game for the taking now and the confidence we'd shown, the quality we'd shown, it's like we're going to be in the Premier League if it, if it just stays like this. Minutes away from going up the steps to pick up the trophy. And then of course, don't make it easy for yourself, give away a penalty. Thomas, he's gone down, it's a penalty! To try and get Barnsley back into it. You're worrying now that actually we're going to give this up again. Right, couldn't keep that one out. He's we're quite brave actually because we continue to keep people up the pitch as well. Barnsley still have hope. Suddenly, it's the red and white end of this stadium that's making all the noise. They kept coming and coming, and they, I remember they had a chance, it flashed across the goal, and I thought, well, if they score an equaliser, it's going to be pretty tough for us to, to get another goal. You can cut the tension here with a knife there, bound to lay siege to the Ipswich goal for the last. Six minutes or so, Nicky Eden, Christoph, oh, saved by Wright at point-blank range. What a save. Surely someone takes a chance here. And then, of course, uh, we bring on Super Sub. And this guy, when he comes off the bench, can be electric. Martin, really self-confident, thought he should have played more. He used to get frustrated, you know, not, not starting as many games as he felt he should do at times. Here is a voice up. Well, it's ambitious with your second touch, isn't it? Long way out and angle. The ball came out, got cleared, just managed to get onto it. He's just made a little point as well. Should he retire? You see in the assessor, I'm all right, I've no problem. And Royce here is onside and he's been put through by Naylor. This could finish it. And he has! The Flying Dutchman in stoppage time sends it to its soaring to the Premiership. George Burley knows that they're there. And at that point, it was pure relief and ecstasy and incredible scenes and feeling, which I don't think many town fans have probably felt. And what an electric finish. He's milking it and why not?
Whenever you see it, it just the hairs on your arm stand up. It gives you goosebumps just just to see that goal back. Suddenly, it's a straight race between them. There was never any doubt when he was going through that he would just score because he was just that sort of big game player and incredible entry and incredible journey. Martin's probably still in the shower now, combing his hair, shaving his chest, but his qualities as a footballer was second to none. And we worked out that let's just give him the ball and we'd do all his running for him. He was never as quick as he said he was, but he had swagger. And my God, he could hit the ball with both feet. He just added something we didn't have. I think I just banged the head on the table like that, thinking of all people to score the best goal on the day was Martin. His hair was immaculate, it couldn't have been any better. My main memory of it was my mum jumping up onto her chair and jumping up and down, and then my dad telling her off because he thought that she was going to fall over. It only happens when you get that rare coming together, the rare, the cohesion of players, you know, on field, off field, supporters, stakeholders, everyone going as one. That famous walk up the steps to lift the trophy at Wembley, to point it in the direction of the Ipswich fans. And that was the realisation of my dream, you know, as a kid. I'd spent many, many nights dreaming of lifting a trophy at, at Wembley. That's a nice moment when you can, when you can come down from the, lifting the trophy, down the steps, back onto the pitch, and the supporters still inside the grounds, enjoying that moment and being able to celebrate with them and, you know, the, all the hard work had come to fruition. People hugging, cameras on the pitch, fans cheering, me giving my shorts to a Barnsley fan, walking around the pitch, you know, it's party time. I, well, yeah, I just walked around with my pants on. Luckily, my shirt was quite long, so it kind of covered me, looked like I had a little mini dress on. I remember the celebration on the pitch, I remember the little flag with where going up. We, uh, we had the pleasure of seeing that flag yesterday because oh. it was stolen by one of your teammates. Was it really? Right. James Scowcroft. Did he keep that flag, did he? But I just remember thinking, I'll take this because one day it'll be worth uh, looking back on. I remember standing in front of the Ipswich fans, me and Jim with it and um, holding it up and I, I felt so proud that you know, I've been able to get a club to the Premier League. And we'd done it, we'd achieved it, we'd, we'd all worked so hard, the manager had driven so hard for so long. And all the fans, you know, they still speak about it now. And they say that's the best day they've ever had in their life. I know I never had a drink, but I'll tell you what, I was high as a kite, I was absolutely high as a kite. I think Jono was probably getting a bit of stick because he'd come off early in the game and yet I think he celebrated more than anybody. And then he was dancing and ju jumping around. I was thinking, you're supposed to be injured. No, I honestly can't remember dancing. Honestly. <laughs> oh yeah, I would have done 100%, but I just can't remember it. That's something that I would have done. Remember having a cuddle with David Sheepshanks. He deserves a special mention, really, in, yeah, in the history of Ipswich Town. He was someone who was a, a, a massive supporter of the football club. David was, you know, really intertwined with everything that was happening at the club at the time, and he was a real good figurehead and a real supporter of the club and supporter of the players. He still goes to games, and I still see him. He's Ipswich through and through, and that was that was fantastic to have a club like that. We're not a backer, people from Ipswich, people who love the town, and it just shows you the, the success you can gain through hard work, having the right spirit and the right ideas. That is something we can never forget.
we were waiting for George, obviously. He was always last to get on the bus, scene of the managers, etc. And he came back, and it's the first time he'd ever been on the back of the bus because they usually curtain, card school, younger lads, and then the senior players at the back. So we had some beers, and he came back, and everyone's jumping up and down, and George, of all people, jumped on the table. And we'd only just got this bus, and it just cracked and bent. And everyone looked around, started laughing, thinking, well, it's his bus, his team, he can do what he likes. So, um, yeah, George led the uh, singing and dancing. I reckon we played Oasis' is Wonderwall 50 plus times on the way back. On the way home on the A12, driving under every bridge and mum's driving in a little Ford Fiesta and honking the horn every time she goes under a bridge and seeing people on, on the bridges like waving flags and going berserk. Everyone lining Crown Street, high-fiving out of cars, people hanging out of their car windows and sunroofs and celebrating on Corn Hill that evening as well and everyone reliving the, the match again was just was really, really special moment. The closer we got to Ipswich, the more people there were on the bridges. You just knew that everyone was so happy and this moment at that moment was going to last for the next two or three days and, and as it happens the next 20 years because we talk about it to this day now. When we got back to Ipswich, there was a function at the Suffolk Showground, which we went back to. We were able to celebrate together and enjoy that moment. Actually, for me, that was one of the, the toughest parts of the day, really. I, I think at that point, where we'd had the game, we'd had the celebration on the bus, by the time I got to the Suffolk Showground, all I wanted to do was, was go home, really. And maybe chat to my dad about it, because my dad was such a big influence, I and mean, he's sadly not, no longer with us anymore, but it, it was always my first port call. Don't, I don't think he missed the game until I was probably 17, 18 in terms of watching me play. I've got scrapbooks at home of stuff that he kept throughout my career. And he was the one that would have driven me everywhere around the country. Sitting at home with my dad, with a beer, and being able to say I'm going to be in the Premier League next year was a really emotional moment. The celebrations continue and we're on, a, we're on an open top bus around Ipswich. You just want to cuddle every single one of them because what we achieved, they were a massive part of it. Yeah, the parade, I remember sort of meeting up with friends, getting all my Ipswich paraphernalia on, wigs, flags, shirts, shorts, seeing that bus turn up there and the trophy hanging off the front. It just felt like it was going to go on forever at that point. The, it was just amazing. The, the whole town was there, it felt like. All I know is that yesterday, 37,600 people went to Wembley, dressed in blue and white, and they did Suffolk and Ipswich proud. Say we are Premier League, say we are Premier League. I'm very fortunate to be able to look back on my career and think, as a group, we got the team promoted. I played a part in that. Um, so to have that memory, to have that medal, those things are obviously very treasured and cherished and, and things that you know, you're able to look back on with a lot of pride and a lot of joy. I was thinking this morning of how many players have gone on to be coaches from that team, really, and it's a great credit to George that um, he could inspire lots of footballers to want to continue a career in the game after their playing days. Giving kids a chance and bring them through the right way and getting them to play the right football and getting success uh, for your club. So that, that, that's, that's always been uh, what I enjoyed the most, uh, being out in that training ground, uh, which, I, which I still miss. Where does it stand in everything you achieved as a football player? It's probably the, the very top. On a football in front, Ipswich was the best years of my career really. I achieved everything that I dreamed and hoped that I could achieve. And I got there with a club that played football the right way. Who, who, it wasn't a big club, but it, it took all the teams on. And I'm proud to be part of 
of that team, to be honest. And sometimes I think to myself, it was written for me not to play, because if I would have played, we would have probably played a different way. And I think it just worked well. And like you said, he was fantastic. And for me, he was probably the man of the match. I was privileged, um, my fellow directors, all of us, you know, to be part of this. And um, they all deserve credit, everybody. And lucky old me was at the helm, but, um, but believe in me, it was a real mega team effort. Really proud of it. And you, you want to look back on your career with a sense of satisfaction. And I, I definitely do my time with Ipswich and that period, especially when we, we had a good side and we got promoted and we kicked on the year after. And, Oh, everything that went with that was you know, just proud, really proud to, and, and blessed to be involved with it. When I talk about mixed emotions, yes, absolutely buzzing, but disappointed, jealous. Yeah, it's crazy that you can feel all them emotions um, over a result, but that's why we love football so much. The players that, that, that then came to Portman Road, you know, the couple of seasons after was, was a real celebration of what what Ipswich had achieved in, 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 in that in that playoff winning year. Realise now once you get a bit older and you're able to look back at these things you realise how incredibly lucky you are to have experienced that but at the time it just felt like the natural thing that was going to happen. It's those games and that that year and that playoff final and the semi-final that have really cemented Ipswich Town in my heart and I love the football club and I will never walk away from the football club but a lot of that is because of the brilliance of that playoff final. It gave me a lot. It was five years of my career. It's pretty special to play for a club which I felt the supporters were liking me. The club was rewarding me in a, in a, in a good way. My children were born in, in that area, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a part of your life which you appreciate when, when you stop playing football. I still appreciate that I played for that beautiful club. What happened on that day at Wembley? If you look at Portman Road now, the extensions on both goals happened because of that day. The training ground happened because of that day. You know, that, that day was such a big moment. 20 years on, the legacy is still there. I went with great sadness to Ipswich. Great, I was lost, really. I was, um, I was on my own. And Ipswich gave me um, love of football back. Um, I had a manager who had faith in me and trusted me. I had a teammate who who were just great to work with. Um, I met the next love of my life really and married her and, um, and we've got three great kids and a family. Uh, Ipswich, always there. Last question. Yep. What does Ipswich, can you tell us what Ipswich Town means to you? Oh. Hmm. Um. Don't, just don't recall that a minute. Great memories. Um, thank you to the club for taking me there. Thanks to George for having a bit of faith in me. And uh, thanks to my teammates for making me feel so welcome. And the best group of teammates I've probably ever played with.